early morning in Kilkenny, home of the state-sponsored Kilkenny Design Workshops. The workshops were set up nearly 20 years ago to promote design and craftsmanship in Ireland, to encourage people like Alex Meldrum, a young County Antrim craftswoman. Alex has travelled the length and breadth of Ireland, collecting over 200 patchworks for a unique exhibition of the craft. She has learned as much about people in her travels as she has about patchwork. During the 16th and 17th centuries, it's thought that a type of applique patchwork was practiced in Ireland. It wasn't until the 18th century that patchwork as we know it today was introduced from England by the upper classes. It was quickly taken up by rich and poor alike. Primarily a craft of thrift, it encouraged resourcefulness. It was a combination of this resourcefulness, imagination and great needlework skills that produced these exciting and original patchwork designs. Patchwork from the more well-to-do homes was generally made from discarded garments. Costly glazed chintzes, silks, satins, taffetas and rich velours. In poorer homes, women tended to buy the material they needed because their clothes were never discarded until they were threadbare. The magic in patchwork is that either cast off or cheaply bought materials were used to create something rich, new and unique. The making of a patchwork was a big undertaking and behind each of these patchworks is an intimate, personal story. Isn't this really beautiful? And it's hard to believe that it was made over a hundred years ago and every stitch sewn by hand. In fact, it was made by a young girl called Margaret Egan. She was only 14 at the time and she made it at her home in County Ross Common. Her father didn't even know she was making it. He didn't allow her to make it because she had asked him could she make it at night using the oil lamp. And he had said to her, no, there's not enough oil because you've got to do your homework and after that you've got to go to bed. So in the privacy of her own bedroom, Margaret made this patchwork. It took her a year to make and all the fabrics she bought from a local dressmaker or from the mill. She bought penny bags of scraps this is why all the reds are different colours, because she didn't buy them all at the same time. In fact, you can see here darker reds and lighter reds. Patrick was largely practised throughout the 19th century, although a few examples do exist from the late 18th century. Today, the craft of Patrick is enjoying an amazing revival, not only in Ireland, but indeed all over the world. And I think we should look back and see just how our ancestors came to create this tradition. Woodenbridge, County Wicklow, in the beautiful Vale of Avoca. Home of Mrs Lorna Johnston and her husband Scott. We can catch a glimpse of the past through their hands which carry on the traditional skills. Mrs Johnston makes a mosaic patchwork. The four essentials of good patchwork are plan, pattern, precision and patience. The pattern is made up of hexagons. So with my metal template, I cut out from cardboard a number of cardboard templates. It is important in patchwork not to mix your materials, all cotton or all velvet or all silk. Cotton is the easiest and that's why I planned my quilt in cotton. Having cut several cardboards, you then cut some of your material. This can be done with a window template which shows the pattern through the centre and has a solid line round the edge. It is not necessary to have a window template and in fact I very seldom use it. I prefer just to put my metal template in the centre of the cloth and cut about a quarter of an inch or even more around each side. If I'm using a material where I want to get a, a flower or other special piece in the centre, I cut it rather larger than that because I have found that you sometimes have to tack this piece two or three times 
to center the flower exactly. The next thing is to tack the piece of cloth to the cardboard using a number seven or eight needle and a fairly strong, uh, perhaps a 40 cotton thread. You must be careful at the corners to turn in the corner very, very precisely and to keep the material taut on the cardboard. As each piece of material is tacked to its cardboard hexagon, it must be pressed back and front. Press again when the hexagons are stitched together. To make the diamond that I used for the quilt, I take the center hexagon and stitch the six surrounding ones to it. It's wise first to put these on a flat surface and arrange them in the order in which you want to stitch them. For instance, the templates where the little horses are galloping round all have to be placed so that the horses are going in a merry-go-round. With a cotton material, you can use cotton thread for the patching a fine thread, either a Coates's Dreamer or a number 60 cotton. With a very fine needle, I like to use number 10 the stitching of the hexagons together is the important part of the patchwork. The stitches should be small and even. They should not go through the cardboard, but through the material only. It gives me great satisfaction to see a nicely stitched edge. Sixteen stitches to the inch is what is recommended. Having stitched the six templates to the center one, it is then possible to take out the cardboard from the center one. Just nip the thread and pull it out and the cardboard will fall out of itself. Then you can stitch up the sides of the surrounding templates. The two end pieces are then put in to form the diamond. When one has a great many materials of different colors and patterns, it's necessary to select those that will blend together. The whole fun of making this quilt really was working out colour schemes. Then we come to the backing. I have not put an interlining in. There is only a cotton backing on this cotton quilt. Three widths of the cotton I join together and then spread them out on the floor with the quilt very carefully on top. The first thing to do is make sure there are no wrinkles and that everything is very smooth. Then starting from the center, we tack out to the edge and the tacking thread from the center to each end. Quilting is done with a fine stitch using the fine thread that you use for stitching together the patches. As the thread and the background color are both the same shade, it's impossible to see the stitches from the front. But when we turn over, you can see the brown thread against the mauve background. This should be done on a quilting frame. Quilting frames take a lot of space. So I had to make do with a small piece of board on my knee. Now I turn in the raw edge of the lining and tack the two together. Then I will top sew lining and patch right around the edge of the quilt. I have not been in a hurry. This quilt has taken some years. It is already promised to a daughter and I hope will become a family heirloom.
Now, we'll open it out and have a look at it. Hold it up a bit, Scott. Just, I wanted to see that yellow one there. I wasn't so sure about the material in that, but I like that one with the black. Do you see that one there with the, ro the little roses? That was Rachel's frock. And then we've got frocks from all the girls. Which one do you like best? Well, there are so many, I find it very difficult to make a choice. There's one there with white flowers on it and reds running across it. I rather like that one. Are there any two exactly the same? That one and that one down there are the same. Oh, yeah. And that's the same thing there with the white one. The same, only different? A little bit different. I tried to vary them as much as I could. And uh, that other yellow one, which I like. Yellow is a good colour for patchwork. It shows up well. But the best fun of all, of course, is the, the stripe, the different things you can make with stripes and small patterns. Do you see that green stripe there was going out like spokes of a wheel? And there's another one, a roundelay there, that green one. Laura Jones of the Ulster Folk Museum talks about an unusual patchwork from their fine collection. This is a fascinating quilt. Apart from the fact that it's very visually exciting and that it's almost perfect from a technical point of view, it's got a very interesting history. It's one of a small number of surviving patchwork bed covers that are known to have been made by soldiers. This one was made by a man who was wounded during the Boer War. And during his convalescence, he was, like a great many other soldiers of that time, uh, given patchwork to do to pass the time. They used military uniforms as their raw materials. And I think there's something of military precision in the style as well. And not just in the style. For instance, if we look at the wrong side of the bed cover, you can see that it's been made without the use of templates from tiny squares of material, each one just about an inch square. And the running stitches uh, are absolutely perfect and regular. And this regularity has been carried through uh, into the overall pattern. Now, after he was discharged from the army at the end of the war, this soldier worked as a farm labourer. And uh, when he left the farm where he was employed, he left his quilt behind him. Uh, we can only be thankful that he did, otherwise it might never have come into our hands. This quilt really shows one, one of the most common arrangements of the log cabin pattern that there is. You can see here how each of these big cross shapes are in fact made up of four much smaller uh, blocks. Now, on two sides, you've got light material, and on the other two sides, you've got dark material. And, in some cases, a different color in the square in the middle. Now, on these three blocks, you can see that they've got different colors in the middle. But in this one, they've used the same material that they've used for the light-colored sides. Among certain people, nonconformists in particular, there was a belief that you should always make a deliberate mistake in your work because nobody could make anything perfect except the Almighty. So whilst there's no evidence to show that this was the case in this instance, um, it's a factor that we have to take into account when looking at it. Avril Halliday is making a log cabin patchwork. The first stage is to decide on the fabrics to use. It's better to try and select one dark and one light fabric, either a collection of light coloured prints or light plain coloured fabric and dark prints or dark plain fabric with one contrasting colour for the central square. Before cutting anything, I always iron the fabric to iron out any wrinkles and just to straighten it. It gives a firm base to rule along and measure with French chalk. The next stage is to cut out pieces of backing fabric, usually calico or flannelette or some fabric like this. They won't be seen, but it's just to give body to the 
individual block. But once the square is cut out, if you fold it diagonally to find the centre and place the central square onto that. Each strip should be measured and cut out to give accuracy when the log cabin square is put together. I use a ruler just to, to give accuracy. Each of these squares will be joined together, so it's important to have each square the same. And the way to do that is to make sure all the strips are the same, so measuring them is the easiest way. I prefer to cut the strips. You can tear them, but I find you get an accurate edge to stitch along. If you tear the fabric, it can pull it at each end and give you a frayed edge. It can damage the fabric, in fact, when you come to sew it. Obviously, if you use a wide strip, it doesn't matter. You'll have a wee bit of edging. But in narrower strips, this could damage the fabric and damage the strips before you've sewn them down. These would all be cut out before you would begin to sew on. The first stage, as I've said, is to stitch on the central square and then place the first strip, which would be the width of that square, on top of it, right sides down, and stitch it along one side. Then when that's sewn on, fold it back. The second strip would be put on, and the length of it is the width of the square plus the width of the first strip folded back. That's just sewn on in the same way, stitched down and then folded back. And the third one's at right angles to that, the fourth one's at right angles to that. The third and fourth would be of a darker colour, and you just re keep repeating that colour sequence with the light print on one half and the darker print on the other half. Once this log cabin block has been completed, that's only one small part of the quilt. This process has to be repeated and the actual design is made up of combining these various squares in different patterns. It's not necessary to decide on a design before carrying out the blocks. You can make all of these blocks, have a collection of them, and then play around with them, decide on what arrangement you want, because the, the possibilities are endless. Laura and Avril carry out some quilting repairs on one of the museum's older patchworks. I have heard people say that it's much harder to quilt patchwork than anything else, uh, probably even flannel, because you've got all the seams uh, to cope with as well, and you've got to be quite careful. You can see Avril, what's happening here. You've actually got to measure your stitch when you come to a seam. I think it's really only when you try to do something like this and try to match the quality of their sewing that you appreciate just what incredible uh, levels of workmanship were achieved by some of the old quilters in the past. I'm told that really experienced quilters actually use the hand they've got underneath to push the needle back up again. You begin to get a callus on your left hand. That was a kind of test to make sure the needle really did come through to the other side so that the quilt looked well like a piece of linen damask really and it had to be um, the exact reverse on the other side of what it was on the top. But of course, they did use quite a variety of interlinings. Um, the one everybody associates with quilting, of course, is carded sheep fleece, but uh, it wasn't always possible for people to afford that. So very often they would use an old blanket as an interlining. Or another thing that you very often find is bits of men's suits or overcoats that are, are cut up and cut into neat shapes and uh, placed on the quilting frame. There's a saying in parts of County Fermanagh that uh, when drapers wanted to make sure that you knew that the cloth you were getting was very good quality, they would say that it'll wear forever and line quilts afterwards. In this case, the frame supported on four chairs, but in a lot of Irish country houses in the past, stools were much more common, and quilting frames are very often supported on stools. Soft daylight falls on the gardens of Butler House Kilkenny and on the unique patchworks Alex Meldrum brought together for the Design Workshops exhibition. This is one of my favourite patchworks, I think, if, if, I have, if I'm allowed to have a favourite at all. 
It's one of the ones that you can really say is patchwork because all the fabrics were literally made from the lady's scraps. She called it poor woman's patchwork because she said she had very, very few materials. All the whites come from all the flower bags that she'd washed and bleached. And in fact, to get a little bit of variety, you know, extra colors into the patchwork, she dyed some of them. And in some cases here, she's got green and a rust color and a beige color. She herself was a fantastic needlewoman. You can just see how the quilt was constructed and the neatness of her stitches. This patchwork, in contrast to the cottons and linens of the other patchwork, has got very, very rich fabrics. Most of these are silks and satins. And in fact, where the materials have come from originally provide, gives us a very interesting story to the patchwork because the lady who made it, she initially emigrated to America and only on the death of her sister in Ireland, who had a very large family, she returned to Ireland then to look after the children. And all the materials that have made up this patchwork have come from the dresses and from all the ribbons that she had for her bonnets whenever she was in America. So you can see here actually in this particular corner, the four blocks here, all the ribbons from her bonnets and all the other materials are from just her dresses. It was the middle of the 1800s, the period when fashion was sort of very, very rich in satins. This next patchwork is very interesting because, in fact, um, the back of it, you can still see all the original flower bags. Um, if we have a look in the corner, and if I pull it back, you've got the detail here. The flower bags came from a mill in Enniscorthy, A and G Davis, and in fact you can see, although it's you'd have to reverse read, it says Rollerval process and 56 pounds, and it mentions Enniscorthy. I haven't attacked the patchwork, although it might look like it. Um, there's a hole in the centre. A mouse actually has been responsible, and long before I came across it. This patchwork was finished in 1861, although I don't really know when it was started. It comes from County Wicklow. Patrick are a remarkable archive of textiles, and we've got a lot of textiles from very, very early 1800s preserved within a, a patchwork like this. This particular patchwork is interesting because there's only one shape that's been used, and that's a hexagon. The way that the lady who's made them has arranged them, she's eventually got a four-sided effect. If you look at the patchwork from a distance, it looks as if it's all diamonds, and it's only when you look closely you can see that it's composed of hexagons. This is a really amazing patchwork. In the patchwork world, it's referred to as a sunburst, simply because you just start in the centre and you're just really exploding. The fabrics are very, very vibrant colours. In fact, this is one of the oldest patchworks. It's about 1790-1800. I counted 2,648 diamonds. This particular patchwork is one of the few examples, actually, that we've got of quilting, really decorative quilting on the patchworks. And in fact, this also has got an interlining. Most of the, the patchworks here, the Irish patchworks, they've only got a patchwork top and a backing. You can see, actually, at the edge here, the cotton wool. That is the layer that is in between the top and the back. It just doesn't have the wave quilting. It's got very decorative quilting, little leaves. It's a really pretty patchwork. This one at the corner here, this was made and finished in 1821. It's amazing actually how well preserved it is and it's just beautifully made. The needlework is just fantastic because there's great details of applique and embroidery. And it's lovely to see that little birds have got the worms in their beaks and the carnations are really, really prettily and the lovely basket of flowers in the centre. It's more embroidery and applique than it actually is patchwork and there's a lovely butterfly up here. I've only just seen that for the first time now. <laughs> the next patchwork is really, really ornate piece. In fact, 
I think that this must be one of the finest patchworks that we have in the collection. Not only is it the very, very largest, it must have covered a huge four-poster bed in its day, but it's got in one corner a very interesting example of clamshell patchwork, which I haven't found any examples, any other examples of. You can just see here four clamshells, and in fact we've got one in the other corner. It's a very, very difficult type of patchwork to make. But all throughout the quilt we've got lots of embroidery, lots of applique, but there's also mosaic work as well. We've got hexagonal shapes there and we've got diamond shapes. And in the centre there's a pheasant. This sort of dates it without even anything else early 19th century. Am I allowed to have another favourite? Because I think this surely must be one of the most striking in the collection. The lady who made this patchwork was the daughter of a lady called Abigail Chuk in the late 19th century. Uh, she lived in Avoca in County Wicklow, in fact, Castle Macadam. It was made on a farm that still exists today. And I think that her choice of colours and just the overall design of the patchwork is really, really remarkable. You would hardly think that this was patchwork at all. The colours sort of blend so nicely together, very subtle. And in the centre, there's very, very delicate applique work. We've got arrowheads here. She's slightly cheated in that she hasn't made exact diamonds, but I would hardly call her lazy at all. Each of these patchworks is a vivid tribute to the imagination of its maker. Although they come from the late 18th and 19th centuries, their bold designs must surely inspire another generation to create an exciting new era in Irish patchwork design. <laughs>